2 Chronicles chapter 20, verses 1 through 4. I'll be reading from the New American Standard Bible. And the scripture says this. Now it came about after this that the sons of Moab and the sons of Ammon, together with some of the Mingunites, came to make war against Jehoshaphat. Then some came and reported to Jehoshaphat, saying, A great multitude is coming against you from beyond the sea, from Aram, and behold, they are in Hazazan Tamar, that is, in Gedi. Jehoshaphat was afraid. Have you ever found yourself in a place where you got news about something that was coming towards you? Well, you got news that that something was about to happen or something was happening and your immediate response was fear. Let me remind you that fear is natural. That there are times where we are afraid. There are times where we are gripped with trepidation and fear based on the challenges that are in front of us. Repeat after me, fear is natural, natural. but faith is supernatural. supernatural. So there are times where we have to arrest our fear and now stand on our faith, and that puts the super on the natural. So Jehoshaphat started off in fear. He was afraid, but look at what he does. He turned his attention to seek the Lord. He, he, he was afraid, and he said, you know what? The proper response for me is not to run in fear, but to turn my attention to the Lord. I've got to find the face of the Lord in order to conquer this battle. He turned his attention to seek the Lord, and he proclaimed a period of fasting throughout Judah. So Judah gathered together to seek help from the Lord. They even came from all the cities of Judah to seek the Lord. I want to take for emphasis verse number three. Jehoshaphat was afraid and turned his attention to seek the Lord. He proclaimed a period of fasting throughout Judah. I want to preach today from the topic, it's the perfect time to call a fast. It's the perfect time to call a fast. You may be seated. Holy Spirit, you are in this place. You are working, you are speaking, you are moving, and we yield to you. As we open up these scriptures, dear God, to learn more about how you intervened in history on behalf of your people. Father, we look at the contemporary problems and issues that we have, and we will gain insight, wisdom, and revelation from the scriptures that you're teaching us from today. Father, I pray that you would strengthen our ability to fight the good fight of faith. I pray that you would use me today to speak to your people, Father, that I would be a vessel to communicate your heart. And Lord, when it's all said and done, that we would not allow the fears of society and all the things that are swirling around us externally to hinder us from seeking you internally. Father, help us to be like Jehoshaphat and turn our attention to you because we need you more than we've ever needed you before. We take a moment to pray for our nation, which is split and divided. We take a moment to pray pray for our families. People in our families are still dealing, Father God, with with perilous issues and problems. We take a moment to pray for our community, recognizing that this is not heaven on earth, and there's so much that's happening that's contrary to your desire and to your will. But we also pray knowing that we are your children, we are a royal priesthood and a chosen generation. And the only way to navigate these times is to hear from you. Help us to be like the sons of Issachar, understanding the times and knowing what to do. Speak, Lord, your servants are listening. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I tell you one thing, this year is almost done. And doesn't it feel like Thanksgiving just kind of snuck up on us this year? Thanksgiving is next week, and for many of you, Thanksgiving is your favorite feast. And in your top list of all-time meals, there's probably two or three Thanksgivings that reside on that list. How many of you like Thanksgiving? Okay. And some of you just start thinking about the food of Thanksgiving and you get happy. You, you just start reflecting and, 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 and most people have a place they go in Thanksgiving. And when there's a place that you go for Thanksgiving, there's usually someone that's qualified to make the Thanksgiving meal because 
Not everybody can cook during Thanksgiving. You need a Thanksgiving certification for certain dishes. Thanksgiving is not the time to practice. Thanksgiving is not the time to experiment. Thanksgiving is not the time to bring that dish that you've been trying out. No, 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 no. If you're bringing it to Thanksgiving, it needs to be certified. Some of y'all won't eat everybody's macaroni and cheese. Candied yams. Y'all call it a stuffing up here. We call it dressing. Where I'm from, dressing. I'm not a big fan of turkey, but I'll take a little gravy with my dressing and my cranberry sauce and we do what we got to do. So, so for those of you, you know, you know this time of year is Thanksgiving, but, but for those of us who are in the core of New Vision, we know something else comes after Thanksgiving. And it's not Christmas yet. It's what we call our 21-day fast and consecration. After Thanksgiving comes the 21 day fast and consecration. So, so you eat on that Thursday. And some of y'all eat knowing that the consecration is coming. <laughs> then you continue with the leftovers on Friday because you know that eventually the 21 days are coming and you got to make some changes. I had somebody come to me last night with a prayer request that said, Pastor, I'm just sincerely praying that the Lord will lead you to move the 21-day fast from December. <laughs> and I'm just praying and interceding that you will move it, that the Lord will speak to you to move it. And I thought about it. Now, some of the qualifying reasons had nothing to do with the spirit. <laughs> had everything to do with the positioning of birthdays. I can't help when God positions a birthday. <laughs> some of it had to do with the holiday season and the invitation to all the holiday parties. But maybe that's why it's the perfect time to call a fast. Because you know on Christmas Day you're going to eat. So what if the Lord is strategically in the natural preparing you by allowing you to fast so you don't overdo it on Thanksgiving and on Christmas Day? That's just a completely natural reason. <laughs> but, but, but seriously, and, and I know that, that many churches, they, they, they take a period of fasting and a lot of churches they choose to do in January we have a rhythm here at New Vision. We do it in December because we want to close out the year strong. We want to walk into the new year hearing from God. We want to walk into the new year with a sense of where God is moving and how he's speaking and, and what he's doing. We, we want to close out the year strong and then step into the year strong. And what people tend to do, people tend at times to just wait until the new year to get their life together. You know how it is. On New Year's, I'm going to insert the blank. New Year's, I'm going to get my body right. New Year's, I'm going to stop cussing and fussing. New Year's, I'm going to change my modality. What if the Lord wants to prepare you before the year is done so that you can start January 1st with the right mindset, with the right approach, with the right heart? And, and, and then here's the thing. The deeper you get into this, the more you begin to realize that ultimately many of the things that we hold to, the rhythms and the habits, they are not helpful for what God is doing in our life spiritually because we've had a hamburger, we're going to have a hamburger, and when it's all said and done, how many hamburgers do you need? Amen. You've been to holiday parties and you've had cookies, you've had brownies, you've had treats, and the question becomes, what do I need to taste and see to be reminded that the Lord is good? And perhaps what God is going to feed me in the spirit realm is greater than anything that I could eat in the natural realm. And maybe there is a hunger and a desire that's much greater than the plate that's in front of me that God wants me to lean into. It's the perfect time to call a fast, especially with what's going on in our culture and society. 
We have a looming pandemic that is lingering and just will not go away. With another round of racial unrest and people are getting tired and upset and and angry about the injustices of our culture, it's a perfect time to call a fast. Inflation is running through the roof and there's so many uncertainties regarding the economy of this nation. And on top of that, immorality is running rampant and everywhere you turn, there are new ways that people are finding to offend God and new ways to demonstrate lack of reverence and new ways to stomp on the sacred nature of our creator. It's a good time to call a fast. Not to mention what's going on in your own life personally. Because some of y'all got some stuff going on and you've tried everything and it hasn't changed and shifted. Certain things that you need from the Lord, certain places that you need to go in him, certain habits that you know you need to develop. And this is the season for you to develop them. But watch this. Some things only start through prayer and fasting. And what I want to convince you of today, that it's the perfect time to call a fast. That in times like these, like never before, we need to hear from the Lord. So let's start by looking at a person named Jehoshaphat. That's a name, ain't it? Jehoshaphat became the king of Judah in 2 Chronicles chapter 17. He was of a lineage that were king after king after king after king that were identified in, 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 in the second chronicles. And Jehoshaphat appears on the, on the scene. And when you read second chronicles and you read, you know, the 10th chapter, the 11th chapter, the 12th chapter, the 13th chapter, the 14th chapter, you'll see that not every king was necessarily a king of God. At that time, Israel and Judah were split in terms of kingdoms. And not every king that stepped into the seat for Judah or for Israel was necessarily a king after God's own heart. But we get some indication in the scripture that Jehoshaphat was actually someone who loved God. And for the most part, he started out as a good king. Look at 2 Chronicles chapter 17, verse 3. It says, And the Lord was with Jehoshaphat. Why? Because he followed the example of his father David. He, he followed the example of his father David's earlier days and did not seek the Baals. Now, David is a legend within the Hebrew text. And then when we get all the way to the New Testament, we see that David was described as a man after God's own heart. We know that David was not perfect, but David was a person that did the will of the father. And, and the scripture is saying that Jehoshaphat was after the lineage of of David. He did not seek the Baals, but he sought the God of his father. He followed his commandments and did not act as Israel did. Verse 5 says, so the Lord, the Lord established the kingdom of his control and all Judah gave tribute to Jehoshaphat and he had great riches and honor. He took great pride in the ways of the Lord and again removed the high places and the ashram from Judah. Idol worship was so widespread in Judah and Israel that not Every single king yielded to what God wanted, but Jehoshaphat was sensitive to the ways of God. He refused at that stage of his life to bow down to Baal and the Asherah poles, and so he started to perform reforms in the land. He took down the Asherah poles, and because of his faithfulness to the Lord, he was greatly rewarded. Listen, there are seasons when your faithfulness to the Lord will invite persecution. We see that in the text. But don't get it twisted. There are also seasons where your faithfulness to the Lord will invite favor and prosperity over your life. Now, God is sovereign. He's the one that's in control of the seasons. But, but, but just know that serving the Lord can pay off. That he had favor and people recognized that the hand of the Lord was on his life. He had great favor and it was because he kept the commands of the Lord. And I don't know, maybe in 2022, for the people who are willing to be bold in their confession of Jesus, maybe God has favor on your life that will be uncommon. The type of favor that precedes your reputation, your reputation goes ahead of you and people begin to talk about you and and the wonderful things that you're able to do and recognize that there's something special about you and you know that the special thing is your relationship with the Lord. 
I'm speaking that to those of you who are fearful to serve God for repercussion. You've got to learn how to just serve God because you love God and let the chips fall where they may. You ought to serve God because you love him and trust that he has a purpose and a plan, whether it's persecution or whether it's prospering. My mindset is I am going to serve the Lord. I'm not going to let the illusion of wealth and prosperity be the reason why I serve him. I'm going to serve him because it's right. I'm going to serve him because he's good. I'm going to serve him because he's sovereign. I'm going to serve him because he's on the throne. I'm going to serve him because he's proven faithful. That is my commitment. And if I have to go through some persecution, that's okay because he's still God. He's still on the throne. He still reigns. He still has all power in his hands. He still has all authority. He's still worthy of our worship regardless. But just get this. There are seasons where favor will come into your life because you kept your commitment. I want to speak to some of you. You've allowed the enemy to get in your ear and to cause you to think that serving the Lord ain't all of that. No, 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 no. You need to understand that when you serve the Lord, it can invite a favor over your life that causes your wicked friends and family to look at you and wonder what's going on. It's just me trying to live the way God wants me to live. I'm speaking to somebody that has a big decision that you have to make and the enemy's in your ear trying to convince you that it's better in the path of wickedness. And I'm here to tell you the best decision that you can ever make is the decision of obedience because if God doesn't reward you now he can reward you thin he can give you rewards that are eternal and sometimes he allows us to experience those rewards now so Jehoshaphat was in this unique place he was performing reforms tearing down idols and poles and and, and denouncing Baal And because of that, he had favor. However, here's the reality of life, and you got to hear me. Sometimes, even when we're trying to live right and do the right thing, we lose our way. And Jehoshaphat is an example of that because he starts off right, but then at a certain point in his life, he begins to veer in his direction. Could it be because of the blessings and the favor that he was experiencing? Here's the danger of getting blessed. Here's the danger of experiencing prosperity. Even when the prosperity was a result of your faithfulness, you can start to trust in that which you have and the reputation that you're building rather than the God who's always greater than you. So somewhere along the way, Jehoshaphat began to veer and he began to do, watch this, things that were politically expedient rather than things that were pleasing to God. He decides to make a political alliance. He decides that he's going to reach out to the king of Israel, Ahab, and he's going to allow his daughter to marry into Ahab's family so that it can uh, develop this type of, of, of alliance or treaty, if you will. But you got to know about this dude, Ahab. Ahab at that time was the king of Israel, and Ahab was wicked. Bible students, this is the same Ahab who's married to that woman named Jezebel. This is the same Ahab that Elijah had to contest at Mount Carmel. This is the same Ahab who has a, 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 an army of lying prophets. And here you have Jehoshaphat who knows what's right. And yet, not only makes an alliance with someone that's not cut from the same cloth, I'm here to remind you to be careful of the alliances that you make. Be careful of the groups that you attach yourself to. Be be careful concerning the compromises you make with certain people because when you get them, you get their crew. And depending at what level of relationship you have with them, you get their crew and you get their ways. And at some point, their ways and their crew begin to impact and affect you. Especially when you're weak in your faith and your conviction. And I know you want to minister to everybody, but there are certain places that you shouldn't minister based on your weakness. And if you've been delivered from alcohol, maybe you ought to wait before you go to the bar to start laying hands and praying for people. Maybe, just maybe, that's not your scene. Maybe you can serve God in another way because if you do not have your flesh in check, 
it can overwhelm you and overtake you even beyond what your spirit wants to do. The spirit is willing and the flesh is weak. So you have to be very careful about the alliances that you match up with in this season. And some of us think, well, you know, Jesus spent time with the sinners. Jesus was completely and utterly secure in who he was as the son of God and his mission and his assignment and his prayer life was right. And he wasn't driven by popularity and pleasing people. So yes, when he sat with the sinners, the sinners were changed because he was there. But there are certain environments, if you don't have an authority on your life, the environment will change you rather than you changing the environment. Jehoshaphat makes this alliance with Ahab. Ahab was married to Jezebel. Ahab had a tendency to surround himself with lying prophets. Lying prophets. And and when you keep on reading the text, you see that Jehoshaphat's alliance with Ahab almost got him killed. That's a word for the naive. You're attaching yourself to people for the wrong reasons not realizing that their foolishness can impact you. Certain cars you ought not get into. And yes, you love your cousin. I ain't getting in the car with you. That's wisdom. That, that, that's wisdom. Because sometimes we get in the crossfire of the relationships that we're in, and we were never supposed to be there to begin with, And now we're calling on the name of the Lord in the midst of something that we really shouldn't have gotten into anyway. But God works all things together for the good of those who love God who call according to his purpose. But still, we still shouldn't have been there. If we're really honest, you got to be careful. The alliances that you make and the places that you go. Because somebody else's bad decision making, somebody else's warped sense of the world and, and warped sense of how to get things done can impact and affect you. Ahab almost got Jehoshaphat killed. Here's how it went down. Ahab had an enemy he wanted to fight. And so he goes to Jehoshaphat, who they're now friends, and say, yo, bro, I'm about to run up on this, on this nation. Like, like you down. You want to go with me? Let me talk to those of you who are dominated by peer pressure. By, by peer pressure. And you don't really want to, but because they asked... Listen, we're not just talking about going to go get ice cream. We're talking about a decision that has moral consequence if it's not right. Jehoshaphat was approached by Ahab and asked to go into war. Look at verse 3 of chapter 18. Ahab, king of Israel, said to Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, will you go with me against Ramoth Gilead? And he said to him, I am as you are and my people as your people We will be in the battle. However, Jehoshaphat said to the king of Israel, please request the word of the Lord first. Do you see how Jehoshaphat has drifted, yet there's something anchoring him? And sometimes we drift. Sometimes we go in the wrong direction. But you still must be anchored enough in your relationship with God to discern when something's not right. And so Jehoshaphat is now relying upon his training, and he says, wait, 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 wait. Let's let's request a word from the Lord first. Before I say yes to this, let's, 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 let's consult the Lord. The king said, very well. So the king of Israel assembled the prophets, 400 men. And said to them, should we go to battle against Ramoth Gilead or should I refrain? And they said, go up for God will hand it over to the king. Now, what did I tell you about Ahab? He had prophets. Not every prophet is a prophet of God because he had 400 lying prophets. These are men that he gathered to himself to say what he wanted them to say. And here they are saying, go ahead. Speaking in the name of God, God's going to give you the victory. God's going to give you the victory. There are a lot of prophets nowadays, they'll speak up, God's going to give you the victory. God's going to, are you sure? 
Are you just telling me that because I'll respond to a good word? Or are you going to tell me the truth? God's not giving everybody the victory right now. Yet the school of prophets, they were sustained, listen to me, by Ahab's provision. They were on Ahab's payroll. So they realized that their ability to eat was connected to their willingness to say whatever the king wanted them to say. People will do crazy things for a dollar. Be careful of prophets that always attach their prophecy to some form of provision. Because they're willing to compromise to get you to give to their cash app. And be careful the type of people that you surround yourself with. I don't want to surround myself with yes people who just say what I think I want them to say because those people can't help me. I need people that are really going to hear from God and say what God says. Be careful the people that you surround yourself with. He surrounded himself with hundreds, 400 men who would not tell him the truth. But Jehoshaphat said, (laughs) <laughs> this is so funny. I love scripture. Verse 6, Jehoshaphat says, is there no longer a prophet of the Lord here <laughs> that we may inquire of? So this is how crazy it is. You got Ahab. He got 400 prophets. And Jehoshaphat is standing here like, ain't none of them got the oil. <laughs> ain't none of them calling on the name of Yahweh. Ain't none of them living right. Is there at least one prophet in this land who really can get a word from the Lord? You see the reality of Jehoshaphat. Here he is. You're the one who got an alliance with Ahab. Eh. But yet you still got enough sense to be able to recognize something don't smell right. So he said, I mean, is there an actual prophet who, who, who hears from the Lord? And the king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, there is still one man by whom we may inquire of the Lord, but I hate him. (laughs) It's in the text. It's what he said. I hate him. I can't stand him. Because he never prophesies anything good regarding me, but always bad. (laughs) Well, my brother, look at how you're living. So he's like, I don't even bring him around because everything you got to say is bad. He is Micaiah, the son of Imla. But Jehoshaphat was like, may the king not say so. Like, yo, king, like if we really going to do this king thing, you got to do it the right way. You got to listen to all the prophets and not just the ones that you think are going to give you the response that you need. And so they call for Micaiah. And this is what Micaiah says. Micaiah comes in. Can you imagine Micaiah walking in with all these fake prophets and he's a real prophet of the Lord, looking them up and down. They don't like him. They don't like Micaiah. Here comes Micaiah. And see, all of the the 400 prophets, they've already prophesied. They've already said, you know, king, you're going to go out to battle. You're going to win. You're going to conquer the enemy because God says so. And here comes Micaiah. And Micaiah's like, they're trying to get Micaiah to agree with them. And Micaiah's being sarcastic, like, yeah, yeah, you can go out. You can go out. And the king, you read it in the scripture for yourself tonight, not right now, but <laughs> some of you are like, that's interesting. Let me read the entire, the entire book of Second Chronicles while the pastor's preaching. You read it tonight. That's your extra homework. And literally, there's this, inter- this interaction, and, and, and Micaiah speaks up, and he says, this is what's going to happen. I saw a vision. I saw a vision, and, and, and the Lord was with the Lord of hosts. And and, and the Lord has something against you, Ahab. And and this this will blow some of our minds. This is like high-level spiritual stuff, stuff that might be beyond our pay grade. But the Lord says, I need to take out Ahab. Who's going to do it for me? And a spirit speaks up and says, I'll be a lying spirit in the prophets. So the Lord authorizes a lying spirit to jump into the prophets that are surrounding Ahab to convince him to go to war. Scripture says that the Lord initiated it. 
So this is the word that um, Micaiah brings to Jehoshaphat and the people. And Ahab is still mad, so he gets upset, throws him in prison, and decides to go into war anyway. It's a bold brother. So now they're getting ready to go into war. They've already gotten a word from the Lord. Watch Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat is sitting here watching this, conflicted. And, 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 and here's what I need you to understand. Some of us need to move from the place of being conflicted with what's right and what's wrong and just stand on the side of what's right. This is the season for some of us to get off of the fence. You stay on the fence long enough, it's going to kill you. It's going to put you in a predicament that you can't get out of. Jehoshaphat is still on the fence, but because of peer pressure, he's not willing to just walk away and mush that dude in the face and be like, this ain't of God. I shouldn't even be here. I'm out. But no, watch this. He is loyal to a fault. There's an Ahab in your life, and you're just trying to be so polite without realizing that Ahab will get you killed. Sometimes you have to be impolite and do what God is saying and just break it off. This ain't of God. I wasn't supposed to be here. But Jehoshaphat can't find it within himself to do that. So here they are. They're getting ready to ride up. Literally, they're getting ready to go into this war that the prophet already said wasn't of God. So, so look at verse 28 of verse chapter 18. So the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, went up against Ramoth Gilead. I look at Ahab, the king of Israel, said to Jehoshaphat, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to put a disguise on myself. Now, they're both kings of different kingdoms who are in alliance together. Kings dress a certain type of way. Ahab says, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to disguise myself, but you go ahead and put on your royal garments. Now, I'm, this is just me. Like, why do you get to hide it? Why do you get to wear a costume? And, and why I got to go out by myself. That don't make no sense to me. Because this is your battle. You're the one that got beef with them. So why am I the one going out representing? I thought we were boys. I thought we were together. Be careful. People change when you're in the line of fire. You find out who's really with you. There were certain alliances you had, and we ride or die. We boys, we girls, and all that stuff. And here you are years later. You can't find them. They never did what they said they were going to do. And you're still waiting for them to stick up for you. Loyal to a fault. So here it is. They're about to get into battle. Ahab's like, I'm going to wear a costume. You're going to put on your robes. And so the king of Israel disguised himself and went into battle. Now the king of Aram had commanded the commanders of his chariots, saying, do not fight with the small or great, but only with the king of Israel. This is how bad this is, that, that the enemy says, you know what? Don't even deal with the soldiers. Don't fight the soldiers. Just go for the king. I want the king of Israel. I want him dead one way or the other. So they're running to battle, and they're not even attacking the soldiers. They're just finding the king. So naturally, where are they going to look? They're going to look for the person that looks like the king. They didn't have cell phones where they could ID the dude. They didn't have a briefing before and say, okay, this is King Ahab. They didn't send a text message out and be like, all right, y'all got your text message? Okay, this is the dude. All right, let's look for him. They said, no, go find a person that looks like the king. That's the one. Take him out. So when the commanders of the chariots saw Jehoshaphat, they said, he's the king of Israel. He looks like the king. Watch this. And they turned aside to fight against him. But Jehoshaphat cried out, and the Lord helped him. And God diverted them from him. Is there anybody here that's been someplace you weren't supposed to be, doing something you weren't supposed to do, you know you weren't supposed to be there, you know you should have never gotten in the car, you should have never gone to the party, and things are popping out, and all you can do is cry out to the Lord and call on his name, and somehow, some way, God rescued you and delivered you. Jehoshaphat calls on the name of the Lord in the midst of his mess, and God performs a miracle on his behalf. Can we take a moment to acknowledge how faithful, how awesome, how long-suffering our God is, that when we need 
need him, we can call out on him. I'm talking to someone that's found themselves in the place you didn't plan to be here. You know too much. You've had too many battles with the Lord to be where you are, but at some point you can come to your senses and call on the name of the Lord. The enemy wants to convince you that calling on him won't do any good. But I serve a God who will find me in my mess and rescue me even when I've messed up. And he will deliver me even when I'm in a place that I shouldn't have been in to begin with. Jehoshaphat called on the name of the Lord. Don't ever get so backward, so broken, so, so busted and disgusted, so wicked that you don't call on the name of the Lord and sincerely mean it. That's a word for somebody. All you need to do is open up your mouth and call on the name of the Lord. God knows where you are. You know where you are. The only final test is for you to begin to cry out to him. And when you cry out to him, he will move from heaven to reach you and to help you get out of the situation. No temptation has seized you except what is common to man. And God is faithful. He'll provide a way out so that you can stand up under it. But you got to want to get out. Sometimes we like the alliances that we have. Sometimes we like the mess that we're in, which is why we don't call on his name. You got to learn how to call on the name of the Lord. That's why your worship will betray you. If you can't call on him in here, it's real hard to call on him out there. But sometimes God will be funny enough to let you get to a place where you're so desperate. There's no organ. There's no keyboard. There are no drums. But it's only you and God in a dire situation. And you call on him then. Jehoshaphat called on the name of the Lord. And despite the fact that he was somewhere that he shouldn't have been, the Lord performed a miracle on his behalf. If somehow supernatural, they were tracking him, and then they just went in another direction. Watch how sovereign God is. Verse 32, when the commanders of the chariot saw that it was not the king of Israel, they turned back from pursuing him. Now one man drew his bow at random. And struck the king of Israel in a joint in his armor. He just like pulled his bow back and just released it. That's like somebody just taking their gun in the air and just shooting it. With no aim, no target, but the hand of the Lord guiding the bullet. As somehow this random soldier released a random bow and arrow and it found Ahab, it went into the joint of his armor. Ahab was disguised, and Ahab was covered in honor, or armor, and, 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 the, and, the, and the, the arrow still found him. Now, you know the history of Ahab. Ahab has a long withstanding history. Let me help you understand something about the wicked. They will always have their day. They will always have their day because God is sovereign. If they're wicked and they continue to be wicked, God has a date assigned for them. And sometimes we look at the wicked and we wonder why they're prospering without realizing that we serve an eternal God who has eternal judgment. And he sees, he knows. But the flip side of that is that the God of justice, if he ever called us for justice, we would all be done too. So let's just trust in the sovereignty of God and let God be God and cry out for his mercy for ourselves. So now Ahab is done. Turn around, take me out of the battle for I'm severely wounded. The battle raged on that day and the king of Israel propped himself in his chariot in front of the Arameans until the evening and at sunset he died. The word of the Lord came true from the true prophet. Now I need you to understand something about Jehoshaphat. He was not perfect, but he knew how to consult the Lord. He was not perfect. He had flaws, but he knew how to consult the Lord. He didn't always make the right choice, but he knew how to call on the name of the Lord. And family, we've got to learn how to seek the Lord, especially in times of trouble. Which brings us to our focal passage for today. Jehoshaphat has survived his alliance with Ahab. But now he's got some enemies of his own. Take a look at chapter 20, verse number 1. It says, now it came about after this that the sons of Moab and the sons of Ammon, together with some of the Minyanites, came to make war against Jehoshaphat. Then some came and reported to Jehoshaphat, saying, a great multitude is coming against you from beyond the sea, from Aram. And behold, they are in Hazanon, Tamar, that is in Gedi. And Jehoshaphat 
was afraid. He turned his attention to seek the Lord. And watch this, he proclaimed a period of fasting. So all of Judah gathered together to seek help from the Lord. I want to share with you four reasons why it's a perfect time to call a fast. Here's point number one. Fasting will revive your prayer life. Fasting will revive your prayer life. Jehoshaphat didn't always get it right, but he knew how to call on the name of the Lord. He sees his enemies coming against him. He was afraid, so he turns his attention to the Lord, and he calls a fast. That fast gathers everyone together, and then he begins to pray. Fasting will revive your prayer life. You'll be amazed at what fills your time when you push away the plate. Bread of heaven, bread of heaven, feed me till I want no more. That's an old Baptist hymn. But the principle is, man should not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And so when we push away the plate and we push away the bread, we're saying, Lord, we want bread from you. Our bellies might be empty, but we want our souls to be filled. And so when you fast without prayer, it's just a diet. But when you add the prayer, it becomes consecration. Fasting always deals with food. I want to help somebody else. You cannot technically fast from social media because you cannot physically eat social media. So when we call a fast, it must have something to do with food. That's very important because there's something supernatural that happens when your body is weaned off of food. There is something that happens spiritually that we cannot always describe, but as your flesh gets weak, the spirit gets bolder. Fasting deals with food. Fasting deals with food, and and when we deny ourselves food, it puts us in a position to begin to pray. Some of you, the prayer is just, Lord, get me through this day while I'm fasting. That's more prayer than you were doing before. (laughs) Lord, I'm hungry. Well, at least you're talking to him now. Lord, get me through this conference call. At least you're talking to him now. Sometimes we start in the flesh and end up in the spirit. You start your fast. You begin in small ways the pattern of prayer. But then you hit a sweet spot. You hit a sweet spot in your fasting. Fasting will, it will revive your prayer life. And, and, and Jehoshaphat sees trouble coming. Trouble is here. He calls a fast. After the people have gathered, he begins to pray. I don't have time to walk through the prayer. You can add that to your homework in chapter 20. But this prayer appeals to the nature and the character of Yahweh. Jehoshaphat begins to remind God of who he is. He begins to remind God of his covenant with his previous generations and how that covenant still stands with his people now. He begins in his prayer to magnify the Lord. And our prayers mature when we put more emphasis on magnifying the Lord than we do providing a laundry list of what we want God to do. At no point, listen to me, you can read it for yourself, in Jehoshaphat's prayer, does he prescribe to God exactly what to do to get him out of the situation. This is a paradigm shift for some of us. Because we're so busy telling God what to do that we miss step one, which is just to worship him and magnify him and acknowledge him and then allow him to craft a plan to get you out of your problem. You're so caught up on, God, I need you to do this, and then I need you to do that, and then I need you to get on in her mind and have her stop doing this and that. And and you're prescribing to God what you want him to do, but the prescription comes from the physician and not the other way around. 
That's the problem. We're trying to prescribe to God what we want him to do for us rather than recognizing that he is God and allow him to write out whatever prescription he wants to bring your healing into your body and to your life and to your family. This is not prescriptive prayer. This is prayer where he magnifies Yahweh, where he takes time to enlarge the character, the reputation of this holy God. And and ultimately, his request is for God to be what only God can be. Jump down to verse number 12. This is how he closes the prayer. Our God, will you not judge them? For we are powerless against this great multitude that is coming against us, nor do we know what to do, but our eyes are on you. You have to learn how to come to God in your prayer with a level of humility to acknowledge that you don't know what to do. So stop telling him what to do and acknowledge you don't know what to do and put your emphasis on magnifying him. That's a great way to end your prayers. And I don't know what to do. But you're sovereign and you know my eyes are on you. My eyes are on you. I was distracted by my problems and my issues. I turned my attention. I called this fast. I wanted to take time to just say that I know who you are. I know what your promises are. I know what your word says. I don't know what to do, but you know what to do. So, Lord, I'm going to keep my eyes on you and let you do what only you can do. After you finish with your prayer, keep your eyes on the only one who can deliver you from your situation. Some of us, we pray and then we get up and just go back to doing what we were doing. And God is saying, if you could just learn how to keep your eyes on me, keep your focus on me, keep, keep, stay right here, stay right here. See, see, there's still work I need to do beyond the moment of prayer. Because you asked me to work on your behalf, now I need you to track with me. I need you to follow me. I need you to stay with me. That's why fasting is important because when we're in our flesh, we just hit it and miss it. But when we're fasting, we have to hold fast. Jehoshaphat gets that. He says, my eyes are on you now. And as he says this, all of Judah was standing before the Lord with their infants, their wives, and their children, watching their leader call on the Lord for help. This is for everyone that fancies themselves a leader at any level. Do the people that follow you have a pattern of you calling on the Lord for help? Let me speak to those of you who have leadership in your household, in your home. You are parents. You are a matriarch. You are a patriarch. Your children need to see you. Call on the name of the Lord. Watch this. Your children don't need to think that you have all the answers. Your children don't need to think that you are superhuman and that somehow you are the second coming of Christ. Your children need to see that, 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 that daddy sometimes doesn't make the right decision, but daddy has enough humility to acknowledge that and to go back to the source and to go to the Lord. And sometimes our children need to see us call on the name of the Lord and ask him for help. So now all of Judah is standing before their Lord, watching their leader cry out and pray to the only God that can help them. Here's the second thing I need you to understand. Not only will fasting revive your prayer life, prayer will reveal divine strategy. Fasting revives your prayer life, and then the prayer that you take will reveal divine strategy. He called a fast. He began to pray, and then God revealed divine strategy regarding what to do. But sometimes you can't get to that moment of prayer If you don't push away the plate, the fasting led to the prayer. The prayer leads to divine strategy. Verse 14, then in the midst of the assembly, the spirit of the Lord came upon Jehaziel, the son of Zechariah, the son of Benaiah, the son of Jael, the son of Mataniah, the Levite, the sons of Asaph. And he said, listen, all of you, Judah, and the inhabitants of Jerusalem and King Jehoshaphat, this is what the Lord says to you. Do not fear or be dismayed because of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours, but the Lord. 
They were in a prayer gathering, waiting on the Lord to speak. The Spirit feels someone sitting in the chairs. It's a verified word from the Lord. Is there a Jehaziel in the house? Jehaziel represents the person that's going to follow the instructions to show up and follow the fast even though they don't have a title, even though they're not in the ministerial development program, even though they're not already having a recognized uh, place or responsibility, but because they're in the flow, because they're in the congregation, the Lord can pour out his spirit on all flesh. A Jehaziel is the type of person that's humble, that's present, that's tracking and may not say a lot, but when the Lord places something in them, they release it and it becomes exactly what the people need to hear. Leaders, you have to be secure enough in your leadership to give space for Jehaziel. Sometimes the prophetic direction doesn't come from the top. Watch this, but because the top has enough sense to call the congregation, to call the people, to have enough sense to invite the presence of the Lord, God will sometimes release the next step in the voice and the heart of someone that's unsuspecting, which is why when we're fasting and praying, it heightens our sensitivity to what God is saying. If we're in the flesh, we'll look at Jehaziel and his lack of title. We'll look at Jehaziel and the fact that he's not ordained. We'll look at Jehaziel and we'll say he ain't got nothing to say. But when you are sensitive to the Spirit, when you have submitted yourself to what the Lord is doing, you recognize when the Lord is speaking, even if he's speaking through a child. I, I, I'm going to say this for some of you that are fasting. Once you get past that irritated stage, <laughs> once you get past that Aggie stage, Watch God begin to speak through some uncommon people and some uncommon sources. Watch him say something through your child while you're driving them to school. And because you spent time with the Lord, you know that they're talking right. Because the Spirit of God fills them for that moment to remind you of the promises that God has for you and for your family. Is there a Jehaziel in your house? Right now, Jehoshaphat is presiding over this gathering, and, 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 and Jehaziel begins to speak. And watch this. It's confirmed that it's the word of the Lord, because sometimes people be talking. We learn that about the false prophets. Not everybody that's talking and speaking is necessarily of God. But this is more than just somebody just running their mouth. This is a verified moment. The scripture says the spirit filled that person, and he began to speak to prophesy what the Lord was saying. And this is what the Lord says to them. Do not fear or be dismayed because of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours, it's God's. Do not be afraid by the magnitude of this army. Do not be uh, uh, fearful of the amount of people that are coming against you. Do not look at their weapons and their chariots and their horses and begin to fear. Keep your eyes on the Lord. As some of us, we are so enamored with how great our adversary is that we are magnifying the adversary rather than magnifying the Lord who is greater than the adversary. Keep your eyes on the one who's greater than your adversary. Listen to me. Sometimes you have to turn your face from the very giant that's trying to take you down. You're so busy looking at the giant's muscles, looking at the size of the giant's head, looking at the size of the giant's fear. You're looking at what the sphere is made of. Man, is that iron? Man, that iron's got little jagged edges on it. You're so fixated on the details of the giant in front of you that you have failed to focus on the details of the God who's greater than the giant. At some point, you got to stop looking at the bill and close it up and open up your word. At some time, you got to stop reading the report that you got from the doctor that shows the cancer numbers. You read it once, you read it twice, you read it three times. Now close it up and spend some time in the presence of the Lord. At some point, you got to turn off CNN, you got to turn off Fox News, you got to turn your social media off so that you can really see the size and the depth and the power and the greatness of your God. Don't you forget that God is greater than your adversaries, greater than your enemies, greater 
greater than your challenges. Focus on the Lord. Don't look at the great multitude, but focus on the God who is greater than the multitude. For this battle is not yours, it is God's. Have you become obsessed with your oppressor? Do you marvel at the magnitude of the hosts that are coming up against you? There's a time where you have to no longer look at that, but look at the fact that your God is able. Verse 16, tomorrow go down against them. He's getting directives now. We fasted. We prayed. God begins to give directives. He's saying, go down tomorrow. Behold, they will come up at the ascent of Ziz. You will find them at the end of the valley in front of the wilderness of Jeruel. He reiterated, verse 17, you need not fight in this battle. Take your position. Stand and watch the salvation of the Lord in your behalf, Judah and Jerusalem. Do not fear or be dismayed. Tomorrow, go out to face them, for the Lord is with you. There is a time to retreat and fasting and prayer. And there's a time when the Lord will speak and give you direction And there's a time to receive what God said, to wash your face, put your war clothes on, and to go to the place that God told you to go. Sometimes that's the gap. That's the place where we falter because the instructions that the Lord gives are contrary to what we think we ought to do. It doesn't make sense. I'm looking at the multitude. They far outnumber us, and you want me to get dressed and to take position and stand in the face of my adversary, but don't you forget that God is greater than your adversary. God will give you instructions that confound you, but that is the place of faith. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. If it's not a little crazy, it may not be of God. If it relies too much on you and what you can do, it just might not. Sometimes God will give you clear directives, tell you what to do, where to go, how to do it, and it's standard vanilla protocol. But there are times where the adversary is so great and the miracle has to be so strong that God will tell you to do something that's counterintuitive to what you would normally do. At a certain point when the Lord speaks, if he speaks, you have to get up and apply what he says. Take your position and then stand and watch the salvation of the Lord on your behalf. Don't be afraid. Don't be fearful. Don't don't be dismayed. Tomorrow go out and face them for the Lord is with you. The Lord is with you. The Lord is with you. The enemy is intimidating, but the Lord is with you. The debt seems insurmountable, but the Lord is with you. The odds seem stacked up against you, but the Lord is with you. You fasted, you prayed, he told you what to do. If he said it, I believe it. If he said it, I believe it. I'm only talking to someone the Lord has spoken. He's already confirmed it. You know it, he's confirmed it and confirmed it and confirmed it. The problem is you, you're scared, you're afraid. Get up tomorrow. Take your position. Stand and watch the salvation of your Lord. Don't be afraid. Do not fear. The Lord is with you. And maybe this is the missing piece. Number three, answered prayer will reignite your worship. Answered prayer will reignite your worship. Jehoshaphat called for a fast, brought the people together. He began to pray, and in the midst of that prayer meeting, the spirit descended on Jehaziel. Jehaziel spoke the strategy, the mind of God. And now there's only one thing left to do, is to worship the God who answered the prayer. Answered prayer should reignite your worship. Oh, to get a word from the Lord. Oh, to get divine direction. Oh, to hear a word. Sometimes he'll give you just a bullet point. He'll give you one next step, but that next step is the first step of a collection of steps that's going to get you out of your predicament, out of your situation, out of that tough valley, and he will guide you and direct you. But before you get up, before you go do what you think you ought to do, make sure you put a down payment by worshiping the God who spoke to you. That's what you needed was a word. When you get a word, worship. When you get directives, worship. 
Answered prayer should reignite your worship. So in verse 18, Jehoshaphat bowed his head with his face to the ground, and all of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem fell before the Lord, worshiping the Lord. As the head goes, so goes the body. As Jehoshaphat went, so went the rest of Judah. As a parent goes, so goes their children. As a leader of a business goes, so goes the employees. We have to have a culture where when the Lord speaks, we respond in worship two things are happening one either he's speaking and we're not responding which is bad or he ain't saying nothing which means that we need to spend more time in his presence but I serve the God who speaks he's still speaking he's still talking he's still giving direction he's still working out situations that our flesh cannot figure out he's still speaking and when the Lord drops something on you you ought to lift your hands bow your head and say thank you Lord for the privilege of you still speaking he doesn't have to speak to you but he chooses to speak to you and if he's still talking that means he's still with you you might have been like Jehoshaphat been to places done some things that should have disqualified you but God is proving himself mighty and strong aren't you glad that in spite of all the places that you've been that you weren't supposed to go all the things that you've done the things that you did last summer the things that you did last year and yet God can reset you and he'll still speak to you he'll still show up in the fast and the cut He'll still show up in the worship moment. It took you 25 minutes just to get out of yourself and step into the place of worship. I'm speaking to all of you talking about why we got to worship so long. Why it's got to be 50 minutes? Because it took you 35 minutes just to get out of your head and to get out of your flesh. And God is so sovereign. He'll still speak to you on minute 42 because he wants to have a relationship with you. He wants to be mighty on your behalf. You ought to thank God that he's so awesome, so kind, so merciful, and so great that he speaks to us and when he speaks the least we can do is worship him oh he's still speaking he's still speaking if he's speaking to you right now you ought to just lift your hand you ought to take an opportunity to say thank you God that my ears are still open up thank you God that my sin hasn't blocked your voice thank you God that you're still willing to speak to a vessel like me thank you Lord thank you Lord I may not know how the end's going to be, but you gave me a next step. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I don't know how it's going to play out, but I know when I get up off of my knees, I know the next thing that I've got to do. But before I get to the next thing I've got to do, let me lift my hands and thank you for speaking to me. Lord, you can take everything away from me, but don't take your spirit. Don't take your word. It's confirmation that you're still with me because you're still speaking to me. A word is what I need, and you gave it. Thank you. Thank you. So Jehoshaphat bowed his head to the ground. Everybody took the same posture he did, and he began to worship the Lord. And then the Levites, the sons from the Kohathites, from the sons of the Korahites, stood up to praise the Lord of Israel with a loud voice. They began to worship in response to what God was saying. But then that worship turned into a war cry. <laughs> that worship turned into a war cry. That, that, that worship turned into a strategic weapon. Never underestimate a person who knows how to worship. And don't take their weeping and their crying for weakness because the Lord is upgrading their weapons and their moments of worship. And when they get up off of their knees, they're going to be ready to charge hell with a water pistol. A person that worships is dangerous because they have intimacy with their creator. A person that worships is dangerous because they have enough humility to realize that the battle is not theirs, it's the Lord. A person that worships is dangerous because when they spend time with their father, the father reveals exactly what to do. That person has heard from the Lord and when they get up and they begin to shout and they begin to praise, you best believe that something's about to shift and something's about to break. Now's the time for us to get up. I need some Levites. And I need some people who are going to stand with the Levites. 
and I need some people who said after I spend my town on the ground and after I hear from the Lord it's on it's time to do damage to the kingdom of darkness it's time to see the salvation of my God after they put their face to the floor they stood up and they praised God with a very loud voice there's a time for you to get loud their quiet praise ain't gonna help you at this stage you better get ready to make some noise you ought to be willing to get out of yourself. I don't care what people think. I don't care how it looks. I don't care what people say about me. When God's about to work on my behalf, I get loud. It's my war cry. It's the way that I remind myself that God is with me. When we used to play basketball and football, we used to be in the locker room just getting ramped up, getting ramped up, getting loud because it's time to go get in the game. After you've heard from the Lord, after you worship, you ought to start getting ready, start high-fiving somebody and say, I heard from the Lord. He's moving on my behalf. He's still with us. He's still with me. Somebody lift their voice and praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Go from worship to warfare. He's about to move on my behalf. He's about to help me when I can't help myself. Hallelujah. 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 Somebody shout in this place. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It might look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. And because I'm surrounded by you, I'm going to lift up my voice. And I'm going to lift a voice that's louder than my enemies. It's going to move past the barriers that are surrounding me and get to the place in the heavens so that the angels can fight on my behalf. I need a hallelujah that's greater than my enemies. A hallelujah that's greater than my problems. Somebody shout in this place. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Somebody praise the Lord in here. Somebody praise the Lord in here. I don't know what you've been through, but I'm here to tell you. I'm here to tell you that the weapons of your warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty for the pulling down of strongholds. Scripture says they rose early in the morning and went out to the wilderness. And when they went out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, listen to me, Judah, inhabitants of Jerusalem. Put your trust in the Lord, your God, and you will endure. That's a reminder for someone you've been trusting in yourself, trusting in your work, trusting in your friends, trusting in your employer, trusting in politicians. You need to put your trust in the Lord again, or maybe for the first time. Put your trust in the Lord, and you will endure. Put your trust in his prophets, and you will succeed. When God sends a verified word from the Lord, Sometimes the pastor has to operate in the prophetic that what I'm preaching is designed to go and to meet you in your place of despair. But your response is to trust what you heard. When he had consulted with the people, he appointed those who sang to the Lord and those who praised him in holy attire. As they went out before the army, said, give thanks to the Lord for his faithfulness and his everlasting for his faithfulness is everlasting. Thanksgiving is not just next Thursday. We should be continually giving thanks to the Lord. His faithfulness is everlasting. Here's the fourth and the final point. And we're going to do what we heard. Praise will reward you with victory. Praise will reward you with victory. The adversaries came against Jehoshaphat. The adversaries came against Jehoshaphat. He fasted. That fasting led to prayer. That prayer led to a divine word from the Lord, a divine strategy. That strategy led them to worship. And then as they continued in worship, they began to praise. And in this instance, at this moment in history, while they were praising, God gave them the victory. Verse 22 says, when they began singing and praising, 
when they began singing and praising. You've fasted. You've prayed. You've heard from the Lord. You've worshiped. And now that you're worshiping and praising, things begin to move and shift. When they begin singing and praising, the Lord set ambushes against the sons of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, who had come against Judah. So they were struck down. And when it's all said and done, the enemy destroyed himself. Because as the praises of the people were going up, God moved on their behalf. And they didn't even have to fight. They did exactly what the prophet said. They stood still and saw the salvation of their Lord. Your praise is a weapon. Your worship is part of the strategy. If you could lift your hands.